My name is Ruth Ann Skinner and I am an acute care nurse practitioner. This is a mini lecture on pharmacology in the intensive care unit. This is not an exhaustive pharmacology outline, but a starting point as you begin to apply your knowledge in the ICU. Patients in the ICU are critically ill and need many medications not seen in other areas of the hospital to support their management. Sedatives, analgesics, paralytics, and pressors are commonly seen in the ICU. Sedation decreases the patient's anxiety. Patients on sedation need to be frequently monitored to assess the effectiveness of the medication. Although there are several sedation scales used in the ICU, the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, or RAS, is frequently used to promote light sedation. Idealistically, patients should use the least amount of sedation needed to provide the desired effect. There are many common causes of agitation and anxiety in the ICU. Frequent causes are pain, anxiety, the fear that something bad is going to happen, shortness of breath, and even hospital-acquired delirium. When you are on vacation, you may wake up and forget where you are. Because your brain is properly working, you can assess your situation of clues. Your packed bag in the corner, the double bed in the room, and even the itchy comforter can help remind you that you are in a hotel. In a hospital, especially as we age, patients' brains take a longer time to process clues. This can lead to significant fear and anxiety when you don't know where you are. Benzos are a type of medication frequently used. It induces sedation and decreases anxiety. It is not a pain medication, so pain will need to be assessed. However, when used with pain medications and opioids, it does produce a synergistic effect. Common types of benzos are Valium, Ativan, and Versed. Ativan is the slowest onset and longest acting while Versed provides a quick onset. Accumulation can occur and daily sedation vacations are important to ensure that the patient is not on too much dosage of benzos. Benzos should be used cautiously as they can cause hypotension and bradycardia. They can also worsen hospital-acquired delirium, and they are associated with higher rates of ICU post-traumatic stress disorder. Propofol is another sedative and anticonvulsant. It does cause respiratory and cardiac depression. This medication is, clearly, is cleared rapidly in the system, which makes it a popular sedative among neuro patients because it allows the nurse or provider to complete an accurate neuroassessment. Because of the respiratory depression, it should only be used in intubated and ventilated patients. It does cause hypotension, which may be one reason why the provider may need to change medications. Propofol has a high level of lipids. Providers should start the monitoring the triglycerides at the start of therapy. Haldol is a treatment of choice for hospital-acquired delirium. It has a slower onset, which is often difficult for the bedside provider who is waiting for the immediate solution for the agitation and anxiety. It has a low risk of causing hypotension and respiratory depression. As it causes prolongated QT intervals, it should not be given with other medications that prolong the QT interval, such as Reglan. Dex is a newer drug that does not cause a respiratory depression, and therefore patients can be given this medication without being intubated and ventilated. It is used with ETOH withdrawal. Dex is very expensive, so Dex is not often used long term. As indicated, Propofol is a preferred over midazolam for neurological patients because Propofol allows for the quicker wake up. All sedation medications should have a daily interruption or a sedation vacation to ensure the patient is on the lowest dose possible and ensure there's not accumulation of sedatives in the body. Analgesics provide pain relief. Morphine releases histamines and has a highest risk of pruritus, nausea, and hypotension. Dilaudid is more powerful than morphine, but it is associated and is also associated with a decreased risk of pruritus. All opioids decreased GI motility and therefore the frequency of bowel movements should be assessed. Fentanyl is stronger than morphine and has a lower risk of hypotension. 
Demerol is less commonly used due to its metabolites causing hallucinations. However, it is still used for shivering among oncology patients. Ketamine is most commonly used for starting and maintaining anesthesia. It produces a hypnotic state while providing pain relief, sedation, and memory loss. It can also be used for sedation in the intensive care unit. Heart functions, breathing, and airway reflexes are minimally affected and have a lower risk than other medications. Confusion and hallucinations are common side effects when the medication wears off. Hypertension and muscle tremors are relatively common in this drug. Ketorolac, or also sold as Toradol, is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It works by inhibiting the body's synthesis of prostaglandins. This drug should be used on a short-term basis due to its side effects. Monitor your patient's renal labs as this should not be given to patients with renal dysfunction or in the gut even gastric bypass. Additionally, you should be careful administering this drug in the ICU as the patients in the ICU are already compromised. Neuromuscular blocking drugs block neuromuscular transmission at the neuromuscular junction, causing paralysis of the affected skeletal muscles. Since the medication paralyzes the patient, be kind to your patient and sedate them and treat them for medication first. As with deep sedation, paralytics prevent a thorough neuro exam. Because these patients are not moving, they are at a higher risk of DVTs and pressor ulcers. Paralytics in the ICU can be used for intubation and to facilitate mechanical ventilations in patients who just can't tolerate the ventilator even with appropriate sedation. Other reasons can be multiple trauma if unstable fractures may cause further damage to the viscera or to promote critical gas exchange as it may produce a small increase in lung compliance. It can also be used in patients with increased cranial pressure or status lepticus. While the patient is on paralytics, it is important to monitor the paralysis. The train of form monitoring is a technique used during the use of this medication to objectively determine how well a patient's muscles are able to function. Histamines cause bronchospasms. Paralysis associated with prolonged muscle weakness causes post-paralytic syndrome, which can be manifested by acute myelopathy and persists even after the neuromuscular blockade is off. It is also associated with flaccid paralysis, decreased DTRs, normal sensation, and increased CPKs. Again, more information about the post-paralytic syndrome as it, combining with high doses of steroids may increase the risk. Shock will be addressed in another mini lecture, but it's important to know about this treatment so that medication can be maintained. Shock is the inability to deliver oxygen to meet the, the tissue's demands. Depending on the type of shock will depend on your specific treatment. Hypotension is a significant problem in these shock patients. Vasopressors are a powerful class of drug that induce vasoconstriction and thereby elevate mean arterial pressure, or the MAP. Vasopressors differ from inotropes, which increase cardiac contractility or its cardiac squeeze. However, many drugs have both vasopressor and inotropic effect. The main categories of anandergic receptors relevant to the vasopressor activity are alpha-1, beta-1 and beta-2, and even dopamine receptors. Refer to this table to identify the receptor, location, and the effect. Pressors have a dual effect on the receptors, but here you can see the progression to alpha to beta receptor. Dopamine is a vasopressor alpha-1 antagonist vasopressor. Dopamine has a more potential for arrhythmias and increased heart rate. As it may increase both blood pressure and flow, it may be best to use in patients with low heart rate and inadequate fluid resuscitation. Historically, considered a poor choice in shock due to its excessive constriction and end organ hypoperfusion. You may even be familiar with the term leave a fed, leave them dead. However, the benefits are continually being observed, such as a raise in arterial pressure, systemic vascular resistance while maintaining cardiac function 
and improve renal function. This is a very common presser used in the ICU. Epi is often used as a third line after norepi and dopamine have failed. However, epi is always the first line of drug in anaphylactic shock. Neosinephrine is a vasopressor. It works by constricting blood vessels and raising blood pressure. It affects the blood pressure and the heart rate without altering the rhythm. I wanted to close and say thank you. With time, you will become more comfortable with medications in the intensive care unit. Thank you.